Hey everybody, today I'm talking about Capital Lux 2 Generations, which is a 1-4 player card game designed by Isle of Svensson and Christian Osby and published by A Porter Games. And this one takes around 30 minutes to play on average, depending on that player count. And before I get started on my review for Capital Lux 2, I just want to give a shout out to my go-to online retailer in the UK, uh, kienda.co.uk. Some great games at some great prices and I'll put a discount code in the show notes. Um, I want to say before I start my review on Capital Lux that I haven't actually played the original version. So as you can see, this is the uh, Capital Lux 2. So this is going to be a review in its own right and there's going to be no comparisons to the original. So let's have a look at the setup of the game. So you're going to have the capital board here, which has these different tiles on them. And these tiles are modular and it's going to kind of change the gameplay depending on that particular setup. So there is some good variation here, some modularity to kind of change the feel of the game and change about how some of the mechanisms work. Um, in this particular setup, we're going to have these blue tokens, which I'll explain the uh, relevance of later. And this is kind of the introductory setting, I, sh I should say. And you're going to have these coins here, which can be points and can give you some good manipulation tools. You're going to have a big deck of cards here that are going to look like this. So um, you've got basically four different suits of cards corresponding to all the different colors here on the capital and on each individual player's board as well. Um, and those cards are gonna range from value two to value six. And before we get started as well, you are supposed to draw those six cards and you're gonna have a bit of a draft. So you're gonna have six cards, you're gonna pick two, you're gonna pass the remaining to your opponent and keep going until you have six cards each and I've got a two player game set up here and, and also you also start with two random cards dealt out or dealt out onto the board like so which is kind of a starting point and the objective of this game is after three rounds you want to be the player with the most victory points and you can get points in different ways not only at the end of the game but also as the game develops so let's talk about how the gameplay actually works. So after that draft is complete, you're going to get stuck straight into the gameplay where you're going to have a look at your hand of cards. And of course, this would be secret to the other players, but just for display purposes, I'm going to play with an open hand. Um, and you are going to pick with one of those cards and you're either going to put them in the capital city on the corresponding color, or you're going to put them on your personal player board for potential scoring. So let's just say uh, this player puts uh, the four on this spot here in the capital. Now, whenever you put a card in the capital, you are gonna take a corresponding bonus, which is mandatory. You have to do it when you place it there. And they're gonna do lots of interesting things. So the green one is quite simple, where it just lets you draw a card and add it to your hand. And this could be a good idea, or it could be a bad idea, which I'll explain a little bit later. Um, you've got ones here. When you play a yellow card in the capital, you get a coin. And these coins are great because they give you two victory points. And they also give you some cool manipulation um, tools or some prowess which you can use again which i'll explain a bit uh, you've got the pink one here so if you play a card in the pink area you are going to take one of the other remaining cards in that city um, of the lowest any type but of the lowest value of that type so i could take this this one here and put it on my personal player board which i'll explain the importance of later and of course you've got the blue one here um, which is probably my favorite where if you go there let's just say this player went here that you are going to pick one of these tokens at random and they are going to show different numbers on them ranging from minus three to plus four and these are going to be secretly allocated to one of these city spots so let's just say i put it on on here like so bearing in mind that i'm going to know that but my opponent is not going to know that and that is going to change the threshold value of these cards which really strongly corresponds to the scoring which hopefully i can explain now Okay, so once players have played all the cards in their hand, the game is gonna look a bit more like this, where you can see you've got this player here, which got all the cards in their personal area. This player's got all the cards in their personal area, and the capital is gonna look like this, where you know people have gone to the yellow areas, got these coins, and people have gone to the blue area and put these markers down, which of course we do not know yet. And then you're gonna go into a bit of an evaluation phase. Uh, we're gonna start with the blue area and work your way to the green area. And the importance of this is very significant. So as you can see here, we've got a total value of nine here in the blue area, which shows the kind of threshold that we are trying to work towards. So this is almost like a, a game of blackjack where you want to be as close as you can to this um, total va value here without going over because you can go bust and end up losing all the cards in front of you. So as you can see here, 
This player has a total value of six on their blue area. This player has a total value of five, and both of which are under that nine threshold, which is a good thing. And however, whoever is the closest is going to get to choose uh, the highest card in that region. So again, the blue card here is gonna go in their final scoring pile for endgame scoring, which is of course a very good thing. But bearing in mind that in a future round, this value has been tanked and is only at four now, and the, both players are currently bust. So that's gonna really influence their decision on the future drafting round where they might wanna boost that back up so that they are not over that threshold. If, if players were to tie, so let's just say both players had a six, then you'd take a coin each, um, which as I said is two points at the end of the game um, and corresponds to this action here. Um, you've also got the, um, let's go for the pink one. So you've got a total value of 13 here. However, we're gonna reveal that token, which is actually gonna diminish that value by three to make it a total value of 10, which is still pretty high for a first round. Um, you can see this player here has got a total value of four. This one's not even got involved. So therefore, this player is gonna be the closest to that 10 and gonna take that higher card value and again, add it to their final scoring. So this one player's got a really good start. Um, then you're gonna go on to the yellow. We've got a threshold of six and there could be a influencing factor here. There we go, we've got a plus four on there. So we've actually got a threshold of 10, which is quite strong again. Um, this player has a value of two. This player's got a value of five. So therefore this player is closest and they would take that six for their end game scoring. All these tokens here are gonna go back into the supply, get mixed up again, ready for the next round. And then you've got the green area here. We've got a total value of six. This player's got five, this player's got four. So of course this player's um, closer to that value and would we'll take that four for final scoring. Now, if a player was ever over the threshold, let's just say it ended like this, where the value's two and these players have got four and five, which is of course gonna make them go bust. They're gonna lose all those cards from those corresponding columns. And um, which is a bad thing because if at the end of the third round, any cards available to you or still face up in your player area are gonna to contribute to your scoring, which can be quite a big swing of points. It's also really important to basically work out or keep in mind what your opponents are doing because as soon as somebody's played all the cards in their hand, there's only gonna be one more turn before all the existing cards in your hand have to be played in front of you, which can really mess things up in terms of going bust or not. So drawing cards is not always a good thing because it can leave you a bit off guard and can catch you, um, you know, with it, without being in the, uh, in the best position. Now in this particular setup, the yellow tokens are also really good because if let's say the limit was two here and I had three in front of me, uh, I could actually choose to get rid of a coin to raise that value up to three to save me from going bust. So not only are these good for points at the end of the game, they're also really good to give you a little bit of a get out clause if you find yourself backed into a corner. And now at the end of each round, you're gonna draw six more cards for each player. You're gonna have another draft the cards in the capital are gonna remain there, um, which is of course going to really change what people are going to do because they might want to boost that value. They might want to start drafting cards if you know the value is high here so that they can play it in front of themselves to try to get closer to that target. So yeah, at the end of three rounds, you're gonna add up all the cards you've collected throughout the game um, by having the closest to the thresholds. You're gonna add up two points for each of your money and you're also going to add up all the cards remaining face up in front of you at the end of that third round. Now, as I said, this is just one setup of the game. There are four predetermined um, setups you can do, all corresponding to different modules, and they do lots of different things when you go to the city, such as taking more cards, or even introducing new decks, completely new, fresh mechanisms. But I think this setup alone does a good job of explaining how the game works and the general vibe and feel of the game. Okay, so let's share some thoughts on Capital Luck. So um, let's start off with some of the basic mechanisms. So we've got drafting, um, and I think the drafting works really well in this game. And I like the fact that you draft two cards at once to keep it ticking along, because it's not it's not a massively pivotal part of the game. It's not really where the fun lies. However, it is important because, of course, you want to be tailoring your strategy towards the certain setup of the game. Um, and not only helping yourself, you want to be making sure that sometimes you're hurting your opponent because if you know that they have loads of cards in front of them and the and the value in the market is not very high, um, you might wanna be keeping those cards um, so that you can play around with them and leave your opponent uh, without any kind of manipulation of the game and can leave them or almost force them to go bust, which is quite an interesting decision to make. Um, the actual general mechanism in terms of you know playing a card in front of you or playing a card in the capital is so elegant. I mean, it's as simple as it gets. However, the waiting behind those decisions is massive for a number of reasons. 
So first off, of course, you're always um, trying to be as close as you can to these targets. However, sometimes there's a bit of a muddy area in those, in those targets because of these blue tokens here. You might know that information, your opponent might not, and you can use that to your advantage as a bluffing tool even try to lure them into a trap um, because you're not so worried about losing those points and they might lose a whole load. So that's a really interesting mechanism. I love it. I think it's so well done and um, it adds a lot of flavor and spice to the game. But I also like the way that you can almost rely on your opponent to do things for you because of course this capital is affecting all the players at all times. Um, if you know that you didn't draft a particular type of card, um, or at least not many of them, and your opponents did, then the likelihood is that they are going to contribute to the capital themselves, meaning that you can probably play the card in front of you to get them as points, which I think is such a cool thing. And you, know, you really do have to bide your time at times and play things in the right order so that people play things in the capital to give you a bit more of a clear understanding on the state of play and what you can or can't play in front of you and what you can and can't afford to do. I also love how dynamic this game is. So not only at the end of each round, of course, the person with the closest to the target is going to take one from the uh, from the capital, which is going to completely change the state of play and mean that you're going to have to start building back up so you don't go bust next turn. Um, so that's really cool how dy dynamic that is in that respect. But also the fact that some of these locations, you know, in this particular setup, if you go to the cleric, then you can take the lowest card available to you in any of the different locations. And that, of course, you can use to your advantage because you might be way under that limit. You could take that card and add it in front of you and still be safely under it. But your opponent might be way over it now, meaning that they might have to change their plans or might not even have a chance to actually get that card played and um, will inevitably go bust. So this really is a game of layer upon layer, you know, very small things, but meaningful things that you have to consider. And those kind of card games really tend to resonate well with me. And I will say that Capital Lux certainly does that. You know, not, not a massively complex game, but the nuances and the way that all the different things interact with each other, the considerations you're making and the decisions you're making are so crunchy and have ramifications and consequence to what you're doing, which is just a really good balance. The time investment of this game is quite outstanding, to be honest. As I said at the beginning, the game does say it takes, um, well, well, the box actually says it takes uh, 15 to 40 minutes to play. And, you know, I will say that in a two-player game, you can probably get this done in 20 minutes. Um, three players, again, probably lean more to that half an hour. But I think the the ratio of complexity and depth in, in relation to that timestamp is quite outstanding, to be honest. Probably amongst the best I've ever played in terms of, again, the, the levels and layers and um, depth here in relation to that time is just absolutely phenomenal. Um, just three phases. The first one goes by you know, pretty quickly. Um, the weighting of those decisions go up and up and up as the risk factor goes up in terms of you going bust or not because you can keep these targets going throughout the whole game. Um, and you know, if, you've, if you messed up on that last round, then um, you know, the, the consequence of that is gonna be massive. So yeah, I really do think this game has a great time investment, a great pacing and a great forward momentum. And um, yeah, pretty much amongst the best of it in those categories. The replayability of Capital Lux 2 is also outstanding. I mean, I would be perfectly happy if this was the only setup of the game. I think there's so much depth and nuance here. This will keep me satisfied for at least 50 games. Um, however, there are, as I said, four different setups in the game. You've got a whole bunch of tokens here, different things you can do, all the different actions you can take by going to those capital places. Um, absolutely brilliant. You're never going to run out of things to do. And um, as I said, if it just came with a simple setup, I would be more than satisfied because this game is more than enough. So yeah, in terms of replayability, um, you're never going to get bored with this one. Um, the aesthetics are actually pretty good. I mean, I don't mind in fact, I do like the how bright and vivid all the colours are. I said normally I'm not a big fan or don't get drawn into the sci-fi theme. Uh, you know, you've got these very futuristic characters. Um, however, I do think the illustrations are well done and it certainly isn't a deterrent for me, not, you know, because I don't like sci-fi. Um, the card quality is decent. I would have been nicer to have um, maybe white bordered cards or do something to make these a bit more resilient because the more you're going to play with this, and it's, it's going to be a game you're probably going to get to the table quite a lot. Um, the edges do get frayed quite a bit and you're going to have those you know, kind of white marks and chips on the cards. But it's a bit of a nitpick there um, and it's not a terribly expensive game anyway. But production, absolutely fine. No issues at all. And card quality is decent. It's not the best. Tokens and stuff are really well. Um, good iconography, nice and clear. And um, yeah, so I've got no issues at all for this pretty simple um, production in terms of it being a card game. 
I also love the way Capital Lux 2 scales. Um, in a two player game, it's much more cerebral, much more head to head. And you have a lot more kind of control over not only your kind of state of play, but also your opponents, because again, you, you can very deliberately do things which will, which you know will affect your you know one on one opponent. In a three player game, it becomes a bit more uh, alive, and you know, the market is changing a lot more. Um, and I will say, I would say it added more chaos to the game, but it adds a bit more again a bit more unpredictability. And I think that actually doesn't hurt the game at all, which normally I say it would. So I think I love, I actually love this game at any player count, um, and it does feel different depending on that player count, but not for better or for worse. So um, yeah, I think if you want a game that's very versatile and who you can play this with, if you want. To Going to play two, you know, two player all the time. This game is still going to be perfect. Um, no, no complaints whatsoever. But if you do have that three or four player count, the game is not going to hurt either. Uh, the game actually does come with a solo mode as well, but I cannot testify about how good that one is because I haven't tried it. Generally, not a solo game myself, and I haven't really heard any feedback on it either. So, unfortunately, I can't give you any information regarding the solo mode. But at that two to four player count, absolutely spot on. So let's share some thoughts or some final thoughts on Capital Lux 2 Generation. So straight up, um, I am really gushing about this game. I think this is something truly special and I do not say that lightly. So this one for me is probably amongst the best card games I've ever played. Um, I put this amongst, you know, games like Hana Makoji. In fact, I'd even say this is better than Hana Makoji, which is not um, something that you can just say, you know, passively. Um, I think this is up there with games like Mandala, which again, I've raved about this year. And it's probably maybe even the top five games that I've played in the last year. Um, it is truly something magnificent. Everything you do here is important. It's got a lot of depth without feeling stuffy. Um, every decision has a uh, meaning behind it. You want to uh, do this, but you want to do that. It's agonizing. You've got to be careful what your opponents do. Um, I love the variation on what the different locations do. And even being forced to do these things when you take the action has um, a big meaning behind it as well, because often you want to add to that but you don't want to change anything else um, but you're going to have to do that so much going on here again that levels of the onion just start to reveal itself the more you play this one and for me this just strikes that perfect balance of the gameplay plus the rules overhead plus the fun factor this really is as good as it gets and for me I think this game is ranked in the 3000s on Board Game Geek that for me just does not make any sense we talk about in the board game industry um, hidden gems and undervalued games, underappreciated games. This one is kind of the poster child for that. The gameplay here is, as again, as good as it gets. It is phenomenal. If you like card games, you have to try this one out. Now, I was very skeptical and apprehensive because I, I tend to not like sci-fi themed games. Um, it didn't really appeal to me visually, but the gameplay is rich, it's fun, it scales great. Um, and again, just those decisions are just there from start to finish. You're gonna be hooked and engaged from the get-go. So if you can't tell, um, I cannot recommend this game enough. This one gets my Elite Shield, a very rare commendation um, for Capital Lux 2 Generations. Again, if you like your card games, this is a must-buy. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you found it useful or at least somewhat entertaining, then please hit like and consider subscribing if you haven't done so already. Additionally, if you wish to support the show because I am a one-man operation and I don't, I don't get any support from publishers, then please consider backing it on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash chairman of the board where you can back for as little as two pounds per month. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time.